Hello, and welcome to the Social and Physical Security Lecture. My name is Dr. Owen Redwood, and this lecture is part of the Offensive Computer Security 2.0 Open Courseware, hosted by HackAllTheThings.com. The outline of today's talk is we're going to have three parts to this lecture. The first part is going to be about social engineering. We're going to cover the basics of social engineering and the fundamentals of intelligence gathering. We're going to talk about evolutionary triggers. We're going to discuss some uh, classic psychology and social manipulation studies. We're going to talk about six specific widely exploited social quirks of the human braid, brain. And then we're going to talk about defenses for social engineering. Part two, we're going to talk about physical security. So we're going to go in depth about how locks work. And then we're going to talk about lock picking with several animations from the tool organization, which we'll mention again later. And then we're finally going to end that part about lock picking mitigations and defenses and how to pick a actually good lock. Part three, we're going to talk about physical access and what an attacker who's sophisticated can do with physical access. We're going to put some numbers behind some of the commodity tools. It may surprise you how cheap someone can pull off some int really interesting effects for. So to discuss all this, we're going to cover several topics, namely what happens below the operating system levels and inside the motherboard bus. We're going to talk about Ethernet over power lines and bypassing physical security systems that rely on them and communicate them. Finally, we're going to talk, talk about building automation control systems at, that are, are using BACnet and recent security uh, research that has gone on in that field. To recap an ethical disclaimer, if you're just jumping in on this lecture, this lecture is part of the Offensive Computer Security 2.0 course. You should, you actually must watch lecture one for a complete discussion of the ethics if you are new. If you don't watch that, uh, that's on you. Two, the primary difference between legal hacking and illegal hacking is only permission. If you do not have permission from the organization to do any of these penetration testing techniques, you should not do it. It is likely illegal. Therefore, you should not do it whatsoever. And this applies for all cyber techniques as well as social and physical techniques discussed in this lecture, as well as anything else. The topics and techniques presented in this lecture are for professional penetration testing and personal or organizational security. The vast majority of cyber attacks involve social engineering components. And because of that, because this class is dedicated to understanding the offense so we can improve the defense, it is imperative that we discuss how to prevent uh, falling prey for any of these techniques uh, so that we stop have organizations constantly be victims to very trivial attacks. Now let's begin. Part one, social engineering. Social engineering is any act where you try to manipulate a person to accomplish a goal. And that goal may or may not be in a target's interests. There are various types. Phishing email, phone calls, in-person social engineering, rumors, spreading gossip, Seeding online dissent, there's all sorts of types. It can be direct or indirect. It often goes hand in hand in open source intelligence reconnaissance as it's basically human, and that's a great compliment. We're going to talk about that, about that in a little bit. And reconnaissance is typically the first stage of any penetration testing campaign, and it's exploration and probing to discover vital information or attack surface information about the target forces, resources, and to put it in military terms, enemy terrain for later analysis and dissemination to other groups in the pen testing group. Now, to translate this into a, a pen test, it would really just be exploration and probing. So probing can be the social aspect, uh, that's where social engineering can come in, or it could be done by visiting the website sending emails and stuff like that, or visiting uh, old versions of the website. Anyways, doing all of this to discover attack surface information about the target, 
what may be inside the network beyond the attack surface and all the other information you may need for your penetration testing campaign. So there's three types of intelligence, typically. There's open source intelligence, signals intelligence, and human intelligence. And these can all be gathered at any stage of the pen testing life cycle, as well as social engineering can enhance any stage of the pen testing life cycle. So even when you're doing post-exploitation, uh, social engineering is very easy to exploit. Say you have compromised a privileged user or an authority in the organization. Say you've compromised the boss or the CEO. You can easily convince people based on the authority of the target you, you can impersonate by compromising their computer by sending out phishing emails to other people, which they'd probably resp respond to with all the information you request simply because it may be in the purview of keeping their job. I digress, though. So back to intelligence gathering. Open source intelligence really encompasses internet searches, which may target a company website. Make sure to target social media, especially LinkedIn. If you see engineers working there, especially IT crowd, and you see they all are specialized in Windows Server or Linux Server, that tells you a great deal about the, the, the skill set that that company is currently hiring for. And it's a great uh, a bit of information to draw inferences from. You definitely want to look at public records as well as DNS records because they may show you uh, IPs and other topology of the target uh, servers and network that you may be interested in. Internet archive searches, the Wayback Machine, archive.org, great way to get information. Um, often security is a evolutionary process and people wake up to the fact that they don't need to put a ton of information that may be sensitive especially in a cybersecurity context on their website so at some point companies that have said too much on their website go through a scrub if that website's been archived before the scrub you can maybe find some really interesting tidbits of information about the processes or services that they use and that may be still relevant to their current network infrastructure you definitely also want to look at company news, any business partners they have, especially upcoming mergers and any form of outsourcing, any form of vendors, third-party vendors that they work with, say to staff or s supply the mess hall or cantina uh, or cafeteria for food, water, definitely vending machines. Um, they may have plumbing services, they may have maintenance services, they may have a uh, HVAC vendor that they typically go through. Um, so this is all very useful stuff because later on when we get into the heart of pen testing, this is going to be opportunities for uh, uh, various forms of social engineering. Finally, I can't stress how useful patents are. Uh, if you're targeting specific systems that are very proprietary or embedded or custom in some way and they're being sold uh, the patents are a great source for hardware reverse engineering that may not uh, always be useful in pen tests but in many red teaming and vulnerability assessments this is a great source of information that's very useful for hardware reverse engineering you simply cannot do business with a product without a patent so often vendors, especially um, in more industrial settings, will scrub any mention of what the processors are and what the components inside the system are. They'll just say this using the latest and greatest and buy it now. And this is uh, primarily to deter competition reverse engineering. But at the end of the day, much of the physical process going on inside the box has to be patented uh, depending on its purpose. So there's some things that you cannot hide if you do business. So signals intelligence, SIGINT, involves Wi-Fi scanning, you know, the classic term war driving is what that is, looking for any access points in the area, uh, doing SMS eavesdropping, which is often illegal, um, but may be allowed per target. Uh, you have to be very careful not to do it to people outside of the scope. Uh, so you should always seek permission if that is going to be in the engagement. GPS tracking, 
is a, another useful uh, tool. If people have their location services on, they may have a noisy mobile device and smartphones can often easily be tracked because of that. And that is uh, yet another reason why bring your own device is terrible for organizational security. Uh, but that's a whole, that's a mountain of another topic for another time. Finally, human intelligence, which is social engineering. So, for intelligence, observables are broken down into direct observations, indirect observations, and inferential observations. And variables are broken down into knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. At the end of the day, all of the calculus of all of this filters down into and boils down into actionable intelligence. Everything that is not actionable is kept in mind, but what drives a engagement and what drives an operation is actionable intelligence. So let's talk about the fundamentals for social engineering and talk about evolutionary triggers. Our brains are really not optimized for modern society. We, as a species, spent the vast majority of our, our timeline in small tribal groups endemic to African plains and other continents, and you'd maybe meet four or five strangers your entire life. It's a very tight-knit tribe in many circumstances. And you would maybe, at most, know 40 to 50 people in your life. Now, fast forward to today. Go to your Facebook and count how many friends you have and Twitter followers and everything else. It's, it's, uh, it's often several orders of magnitude larger than that. Um, so it's quite sound to say that evolutionarily speaking, our brains have not quite adjusted to the vast uh, rise over the last just simple hundred of years. And so allow me to talk about a few uh, examples from biology. A good one is in terms of uh, evolved behavior that people are born with. Uh, it's not necessarily learned behavior, uh, but this is behavior that people are born with that is either symbiotically used in nature or in some very interesting cases another creature has come along in the evolutionary chain and exploits this underlying symbiotic trust relationship so the first first discussion is the cro crocodile and the plover bird and uh obligatory luke cage meme for uh, explaining this to some of you if you're fans and uh, this is Diamondback, not Luke Cage. Anyways, uh, the plover bird will crawl into a crocodile's mouth and it will pick at the meat in the mouth of the crocodile. The crocodile eats birds. It eats all sorts of things, but it definitely eats birds. But biologists have found that the crocodile will crawl up on the shore, open its mouth, and allow these birds it doesn't there's been no uh body of work that i know of that establishes that they form individual trust relationships by learning uh, a bird's identity and only offering this free meal to an individual bird instead they just open their mouth and it's like okay some birds will come and clean my mouth out and so that's what it does it just it announces a free meal by opening its jaw lets the birds carefully approach and uh there's no quiescence dance which we'll talk about in a little bit uh so there's no observed trigger for this interaction and biologists largely believe that the crocodiles just wait with their mouth their mouth open as an open invitation and so the it's a win-win for both of them. The crocodile doesn't have rotting meat and food stuck in his teeth that can cause uh, damage to his jaw and teeth. And it avoids the pain of dealing with that. And the birds get a free meal and everyone wins. 
A very similar relationship is the grouper and the, the cleaning fish or the cleaner fish. Um, and the grouper has evolved to uh, even very young grouper. They have this established trust relationship. Uh, it happens even at the very youngest age. So it's, just, it's assumed to be an evolutionary trigger that um, this very shiny species of cleaner fish will dance in front of the grouper's eyes and the grouper will just be hypnotized it will drop its jaw it'll just go slack jawed and the cleaning fish goes inside its mouth and cleans all inside of it and then it leaves and then the grouper wakes up uh, moments afterwards they don't know if the grouper is none the wiser but now it has a clean mouth and it's the same sort of deal and this is an evolved trust relationship. You can basically take these two animals and drop them in a random tank, and they will engage in this behavior. Uh, and uh, what is interesting, as biologists have found, is that uh, this is a dead fish at the bottom, but when it's live, it's just as shiny. And we'll talk about the relationship in just a moment. They found that in this relationship... Uh, another creature evolved with this evolutionary relationship, uh, but in a form of mimicry, and they would mimic the cleaner fish. And there's three forms of mimicry, but uh, this fish down below is, is known as a saber-toothed blenny. Weird name. I don't know who named it, but that's what the name they choose. It also is very shiny when it's alive. It's It has... Uh, been born with this knowledge and this behavior and this instinct and it will swim in front of the grouper and do the same little quiescence dance and dazzle the grouper the grouper will go slack jawed and then it goes in and actually bites the grouper's mouth but the grouper is still slack jawed it doesn't notice the pain it doesn't feel the pain uh, and the saber tooth blenny gets a meal out of the, the grouper's mouth eats his tongue, eats his jaw, and uh, they found very old grouper uh, often with a lot of damage to the inside of their mouth because of these, uh, these, uh, these creatures. And uh, this relationship is a form of aggressive mimicry. And so to break down the mimicries, there's Batesian mimicry, which is a prey versus predator uh, relationship. There's Mullerian mimicry, which is poisonous prey versus predator. And there's aggressive, where there's predator versus predator. And uh, Batesian mimicry is where, say, beetles and other insects mimic uh, more scary things. Or maybe they use camouflage, if I'm understanding it correctly, uh, to fool predators. And poisonous prey versus predators, they may uh, mimic more scary things or uh, non-tasty things. And again, being poisonous helps them because then even a simple encounter or bite out of the prey may wake up the predator. And finally, the aggressive where a predator is mimicking uh, some other f creature and exploiting the relationship in forms of evolutionary trigger uh, that its prey, in other words, the other predator may have with it to exploit that relationship. Anyways. <clears throat> taking mimicry to the human level uh, I guess at some point during everyone's lives they probably heard the advice to look like you fit in well that is perhaps the best advice anyone could give you for social engineering and pen testing and doing any form of engagement where you're going on site and dealing with people because if you stick out like a sore thumb it's going to raise all sorts of red flags so there's three categories really um uh, that I break it down to is trying to fit in with the normal day to day and there's a number of scenarios and personas that are compatible with that um, and so often delivering flowers delivering packages delivering pizza uh, sometimes depending on the organization you may be able to blend in day to day by looking like tech support um, and coming to help someone and uh, another example is uh, if you've done the OSINT properly and you've identified third parties, 
You may be able to fit in with scheduled events or sometimes stage unexpected, or sorry, uh, yeah, surprise but normal events like a fire marshal inspection. So uh, a regular delivery from a vendor or some other activity like restocking the, the Coke vending machine or Pepsi vending machine. Uh, any form of surprise inspection, which may be a fire marshal inspection, a HIPAA inspection, other forms of audits. Uh, typically, PCI compliance audits are announced because of the personal, personally identifiable information uh, at the core of them. Anyways, uh, health inspection and etc. Um, now, there's a final... Uh, category that I call fitting in with crisis response um, and this is for exploiting the fact that extraordinary circumstances often cause people to drop their guard so if you're running a company and you have a visitor and they fake a heart attack um, you're going to call 911 you're going to assume your phone call goes through you're going to request an ambulance Whoever shows up, you're going to trust that they are an EMT and they are there to fix your problem. Or if you have a fire drill, someone pulls the fire alarm and then firefighters show up. You're going to assume that it's all legit because often it's very, very costly to get a fake fire truck or get a fake ambulance or etc. I'm not advising anyone to do these things, but attackers may do these things. Um, it is in the realm of plausibility. Um, so academically speaking... Uh, we do tend to drop our guard when extraordinary things happen, especially when someone's hurt. Uh, so that is an avenue that you should be wary of, um, especially fire drills when everyone's evacuating. It's a chaos um, so if someone's pulled the fire alarm. Uh, so <clears throat> moving on, um, it's really worthwhile talking about this harvard 70s compliance study and uh it's a famous psychology study that happened in the 70s and its goal was simply to study compliance and pretty much what parameters you can hack to increase your chance of compliance in the general case and so it explored what is the minimum we need to do or say in order to get someone to do us a favor the experiment was set in the library of the Harvard University and occurred a week uh, before or during midterms as well as finals. And the testees and the subjects were all students. And the approach was that grad students would approach people in the library who are already using the copy machine and say, hey, can I use the copier because blah, and they would vary the reason there. And to contrast it, the control group would be, can I use the copier? And so they were trying to see, in their initial experiments, what sort of compliance range they'd get. So they'd have a very simple question for the control group, saying, I have five pages, can I use a copier? And in general, through the trials, they got a 64% compliance rating. And there's no reason given. It's just two statements. I have five pages. Oh, sorry. A statement in question. Can I use the copier? And 64% of the people asked uh, did them the favor of letting them use the copier and cutting in line. <clears throat> or rather, <laughs> interrupting their use of the copier. Now, for exploring reasons and varying them, uh, the first trial was I have five pages. Can I use the copier because I am in a hurry? It's a pretty good reason. And with that, they got 94% compliance rating. And so past that, they drilled deeper and they wanted to explore whether or not they could vary the lameness of the reason given and explore how it affects that baseline compliance rate range. And so they had about 60 to 94% compliance with uh, no reason to very good reason. And so they explored more and more less compelling reasons, increasingly lame reasons. And uh, it's kind of uh, like 
psychology hacking. I, I appreciate the study. So the results surprisingly yielded relatively high compliance until ultimately uh, they decided to try this trial and the question asked was, hi, I have five pages. Can I use the copier because I need to make copies? There's not a reason. It's the because is restating the request. It's circular logic. It's a specious reason. And it's still in throughout the experiments it had 93% compliance rating. And it is logically it's equivalent to hi I have five pages, can I use the copier? And so it got it it's a trial with arguably no reason whatsoever, but it had just as good compliance rating as the trial number one, which had a pretty damn good reason that hi, I have five pages, can I use the copier because I am in a hurry? And so at the end of their hundreds of experiments, uh, the researchers concluded that the magic word here that affects compliance is the word because. And they argue that this exploits an evolutionary trigger, like our story with Sabretooth Plenty. Our brains, they go on to argue it's because our brains are not optimized for the modern world, and we've already gone over this, and uh, small tribes had very few liars, and liars would often get exiled or shamed. However, nowadays, we meet so many people, uh, this paradigm has totally changed. And so in the next part, I want to explore six ex widely exploited quirks of the human brain. And they are reciprocity, consistency, social proof, liking, authority, and scarcity. And before you go on thinking about how to exploit them for penetration testing or whatever, you should understand that these quirks are already widely exploited by capitalism, by marketing, by advertising, by sales and businessmen every single day. And by the end of this part of the lecture, you'll see why and maybe your eyes will be open some. So, so, for the reciprocity quirk, it is that the phenomenon that we tend to return favors regardless of what the original favor was. Even if we didn't ask for the original favor, we didn't even want it. And this is something that, for an example, is commonly exploited by charities. They will hand you flowers, drinks, or snacks, say at a big reception, um, and then they'll later ask you for donations, and this is targeted to exploit the temptation to return the favor to give back. Um, there are ways you can use this uh, to your advantage, uh, such as exploiting reciprocity during negotiation. You can make a concession and ask for one return. That's pretty much the foundation of negotiation 101. Um, and the concession that you make may be entirely irrelevant and in fact uh, many people put price points so high that when they make that first concession it then tempts you now even more to buy uh, and uh, another example uh, for perhaps your career and professional life if you want to use social engineering to benefit your performance reviews or discussions of your performance with your boss. Um, a pretty good example is doing some favor for your boss even when they don't ask for it, as long as it's not insulting. Um, could be something along the lines of saying, hey, I fixed a printer for you. Letting that set in and say, ask, hey, is this a good time to talk about my performance evaluation? Um, you never really want to do your performance evaluation discussion when anyone's in a bad mood. So that's probably one good way of doing a favor for them to, uh, to make sure that it's at least a little bit more favorable. The next quirk is the consistency quirk, and it's the phenomenon that we try to be consistent with our prior actions even if the reasons for the original actions have changed. Charities also exploit this. Uh, they'll give you a survey asking what sorts of things you typically do, 
and then they'll call you two weeks later asking you to do those exact things in terms of donation. Um, salesmen exploit this. They'll do this by first, before discussing any price points, this or that. They'll get you to start filling out a form before asking you to commit, just so they can run information, maybe look up what sort of line of credit they can extend to you for a car and stuff like that. And uh, this simple act of starting the process exploits this consistency quirk and it's often surprising just how much info they can get by asking you to decide whether or not you want to buy the product uh, I've seen myself uh, salesmen be able to get name address date of birth social security numbers and everything else before they ask the the, the customer whether or not they want to buy and uh, so um, even if the initial terms change, this may still be an exploitable quirk uh, if you've got them to start filling out and start committing to some part of the process. Now for one of the more interesting ones. The social proof quirk is the phenomenon that we try to do and think what other people who seem like us do and think. This is why laugh tracks work. Even when it's a live studio audience and they know there's a laugh track it still works and it still works when you're watching at home and you know that there's a laugh track it's it's a really interesting phenomenon if you if you pain yourself and stress yourself to make yourself aware of these things um, crowd theory is a huge school of I guess psychological research but uh, it's it revolves around the phenomenon that people behave like the majority of the group and uh, often the group ends up in some uh, cases acting like the most outspoken and this is how riots start it really really is it's because of this phenomenon the social proof quirk it's because on their own individuals do not just go wake up one day and be like hey I'm gonna go out protest by myself I'm going to go out, burn cop cars, and loot, and break windows, and, you know, spray paint things by myself. Um, at least the vast majority of normal humans. And uh, on a different note, because of crowd theory, being in the middle of the crowd is the most dangerous situation you can ever be in to have a health health scare, such as a heart attack. Everyone collectively freezes. And the social proof phenomenon kicks in and everyone else just waits for someone else to take charge, which is why they teach EMTs and people who do uh, emergency medical training um, that the first thing you should do is take charge. You assign people tasks. You call the police. You get me some water. You get me some towels and so on. Um, and otherwise, everyone will just sit there and their lizard brains kick in, um, which is why, again, I said that when uh, there's extraordinary circumstances, people can collectively freeze and that can be an exploitable uh, uh, scenario in the abstract case for social engineering that people need to be aware of. <clears throat> so this has also had a new, um, new life and form and shape online uh, through group subversion. It's been going on for thousands of years since uh, Sun Tzu uh, but group subversion is basically manipulating groups by steering the notions of acceptability by spoofing the social proof. And for an example, um, uh, one common thing that probably most people have encountered without noticing is malicious or fake reviews, like uh, bad Yelp reviews or bad Amazon product reviews often from competitors. And probably the most famous example that most people will realize is the, the famous faked Tesla car review where uh, the journalist said they picked up the Tesla, they took it on a test drive, it had all these problems, it broke down, it just was terrible, and it got lost, and uh, Tesla got it back, and it's like, okay, so we went through the black box on the computer, and we can replay everything you did, and we've debunked every one of your claims as BS. And so uh, this, um, form of uh, 
subversion is being increasingly used in ransom attacks and scams on small businesses where businesses will get targeted uh, advertising saying, hey, there's X number of bad reviews about your company. Pay for our service to help fix them. And uh, scammers will usually target you after they've spent a week or, you know, probably automated. It takes an hour to submit all these bad reviews. And then they come and say, hey, we'll get rid of them for you. But they're the ones behind it in the first place. Um, but keep in mind that competition is increasingly in global markets exploiting this and uh, submitting bad reviews and fake reviews for their comp competition products. And this, this works. I mean, ask yourself, when you go shopping for stuff online, you read the reviews. If you see a review that's exceptionally bad and it's from someone who has a use case similar to yourself for that product, and the person sounds like you and thinks like you and explains coherently why this is a bad product, it's a pretty valuable review to you. Um, but I digress. Uh, so online, this is becoming a big thing that's being very easily exploited by botnets. Uh, Capture only slows it down, but bots can submit mass reviews and uh, for say, uh, subreddits and stuff like that, they can submit mass upvotes and downvotes. CAPTCHAs only really slow it down, but uh, it's being used to shape both uh, social media in an automated fashion, as well as uh, markets. So other examples of this outside of fake reviews are concern trolling, shilling, astroturf services, which are being advertised online. You can find them almost in most first world countries now, some form of company that does it. It's not really illegal. Uh, uh, it often sits just outside what is considered uh, liable um, and suable. And the worst part is it's when it's done, there's almost no attribution, uh, as is with most things on the internet. And uh, another goal uh, is for demoralization of opposition and competition. And uh, the next quirk is the liking quirk, and that's a phenomenon where we tend to cooperate with someone who seems to like us. This is exactly why good cop, bad cop works. The bad cop comes in and roughs you up, and you just feel low, you feel like crap. It'd be nice to have a friend, and then boom, the good cop comes in, has the bad cop back off, pulls its leash back, and then you're more inclined to cooperate with them. And uh, salesmen tend to exploit this by referrals. They'll say things like, hey, your friend suggested I call you, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's the, another point worth making is that flattery is universally useful for exploiting the liking quirk. Um, and many studies have shown that even inaccurate or bad flattery works just as well, if not more sometimes, than accurate flattery. Like if the person has really good hair, accurate flattery is, man, your hair is really great today. Um, and an example of absurd flattery is, hey, that's an awesome tail you have there, or your wings look great today. Uh, the brain interprets just the simple attempt at flattery as flattery. So you don't have to try that hard. In fact, sometimes you can defuse or disarm people with bad flattery. Um, Accurate flattery may be taken wrong in some cases and be seen as uh, romantic or sexual advances, the attempts to hit on the person. But if you say, man, your fur looks great today. What did you do to your, your mane? Um, and something like that, you may uh, disarm any, let's say, uh, suspicions the person may have about you in that circumstance. As long as you have a good uh, sense of humor and you're a good comedian to keep the, the, the mood up. Anyways, the next quirk is the authority quirk. And that is a phenomenon where we'll cooperate with someone who seems to be in charge. And the most white, the, probably the most famous example of this is the, uh, I think it was, whoops, the Maxwell House Coffee TV advertisement from the 70s where uh, this famous actor would simply state, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV, and I drink Maxwell House coffee, and you should too. 
it according to all the statistics and uh, the, the marketing stats it's the most successful TV ad of all time and so a lot of uh, a, a lot of ads have tried to imitate it um, and uh, this works in the social engineering and pen testing uh, arena where um, wearing a lab coat, wearing a badge, wearing security or staff shirts, or looking like you fit in, but are also uh, of have some authority is extremely useful in uh, uh, convincing people to comply with your requests. <clears throat> and uh, next one is the scarcity quirk, and that's the phenomenon that we tend to overvalue apparently scarce resources. Uh, the best example of this are famous cookie jar experiments, which you can uh, probably find hundreds of on uh, the internet. And that's simply where people go to the grocery mart store and uh, they'll have a table and it'll just be free cookies. And uh, try one, you only get one. And so they'll have two jars and they'll be the exact same cookies in each but they'll fill one jar to the brim and then they'll have a very small amount of cookies in the other one. And the experiments repeatedly find that people always go for whatever looks like the, uh, the more attractive cookie or they, rent, they judge the attractiveness based on how much, how little of it there is. So they see less amount of cookies and they instantly conclude that hey, this must be the one that everyone else is doing. Um, so I better get it before it runs out. <clears throat> so this is why limited time offers and, ho and se uh, seasonal toys and gift cards uh, are typically successful. Um, and on the other hand, this is also why censorship uh, often backfires, especially um, since it is a form of information scarcity and uh, many studies of psychology studies have found that in the courtroom one of the most ignored statements or requests is that of the judge or the prosecution ordering the jury to ignore that statement or evidence um, because it, it, it's now seen as oh well, why do they want us to ignore that it must have some valid points um, so in a conversational sense you can exploit this quirk by sharing partial details of some topic with the person you're talking to and then abruptly end with things like I'm sorry I can't say more but you know between you and me you know we never had this conversation and say things like I'm sorry I, I shouldn't have said that I've said too much uh, please forget what I've told you and etc when you when you say stuff like that I mean it almost always results in you now really have their attention um, so you might be able to ask them for some favor and then you'll tell them the rest of the story, uh, kind of deal. Uh, for social engineering stories, I've seen, uh, dozens of pen tests go like this. They show up to the secretary's desk or the, the, the front person's desk and they say, Hey, I'm only here to noon. So if you don't authorize me to fix your problems, you have to wait till next month for me to return. And then there'll be some argument. And you can reiterate this point and you can be like, good luck explaining this to your boss. I can't, I, I don't know why your list doesn't show me on the schedule, but I was asked to come here and I'm a very busy technician, blah, blah, blah. Um, another very risky uh, example of using this in your career to get ahead is making yourself appear scarce by mentioning how much uh, the competition or other opportunities are interacting with you. Uh, that can easily backfire if you are not in demand. <laughs> so in reality, these tricks only statistically increase the odds of compliance. In order to really uh, exploit these effectively, you need finesse, you need charisma, you need good social skills, you need sharp improv skills, and you need timing. Timing is a huge factor. And it's not always going to work. Uh, you can't just say, I need to fix stuff in the server room, so let me in the server room because I need to fix stuff in the server room. Uh, it's probably going to raise too many flags. Um, and you definitely can't say anything like, remember how you gave me a raise last week? Well, it's about that time again. 
I don't think you could exploit the consistency quirk ever like that. Good luck though. So at the end of this class, and in reality, social engineering is usually the easiest way into the system. And I always teach people that given a large enough company with, in terms of number of employees, social engineering tricks when applied on a mass scale are guaranteed to have some success. But it, however, if you do mass phishing campaigns, they're gonna get noticed right away. So the time window for the, uh, the pen test target uh, people to download to click on you know the fish the 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 set say uh, rat that you've attached um, from the social engineering toolkit is very limited so it's pretty much only useful for smash and grab style attacks unfortunately this is one of the most one commonly exploited ones by cyber criminals and they instead attach ransomware and crypto locker and stuff like that and it's un unfortunately incredibly effective and people are waking up there i mean it's been harped on for 10 20 years that don't click attachments from strangers and don't download and run things through email ever but people still do it um and it's hitting important uh systems like hospital systems police uh, computers, systems, um, big enterprise networks, etc. It's <laughs> it's really shocking sometimes. So, for companies, they really need to be aware of targeted uh, phishing, especially targeted post exploitation spear phishing, where you get a strange request from your boss's email account um, asking for something out of the ordinary. You should always, always follow up in person. You should call them. Don't ever take some strange request that gives the uh, gives your boss access to a system uh, for face value. It may be someone who's hacked into their account, hacked into their box, and is exploiting that relationship uh, to spread throughout the network or obtain more information or loot. So companies definitely need to be aware of surprise visitors or inspections, fake fire alarms, fake accidents, visitors having accidents, ran especially also random gifts or packages in the mail. Uh, there was uh, one of the, uh, well, I have it later in the, the lecture, but there's a, a DEF CON talk where uh, one of the pen testers emailed the target company a bunch of gaming computers to their uh, their IT staff, and they're like, oh yeah, these are way better, sorry, gaming keyboards, to the IT staff, and the IT staff is like, oh, this is way better than our old keyboards. So they plug them all in, but they're all backdoored, and with implants that key log everything and then they just uh, dialed back a week later and the pen test team had all the root passwords they had everything um, so defending yourself on a personal level is really hard uh, the best thing you can do is raise awareness of these principles and the best way to become good at things is to teach others about them it really is that Especially the best bar is teaching them to be able to do the, the, the skills. But anyways, uh, at home you can practice by resisting advertisements. Everyone has to watch them so you can watch them, pay attention, and try to identify which of these quirks or other quirks they are trying to exploit. And uh, you can also practice by manipulating your friends. Uh, so to recap, the six widely exploited quirks of the human brain are reciprocity, consistency, social proof, liking, authority, and scarcity. Exploiting combinations of these quirks may increase chances of success. However, overdoing it may raise very obvious red flags. The magic word in all cases is because. It often does not matter what follows the word because. In some cases, as long as what you're asking for is not uh, too great in terms of cost, reiterating your need as the reason in terms of offering circular logic, I need to use the copier because I need to make copies, may have a higher compliance frequency than whatever other reason you can come up with. And that's because our brains have not caught up to modern life. 
So from to end this part, uh, some resources I would recommend are uh, Robert uh, Cialdini's book, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, Scott Adams' reading list on persuasion. Uh, he's the guy behind the Dilbert comics, and he's a trained hypnotist and does a lot of uh, writing about uh, persuading people and uh, it's really great stuff. If you get to the end of this entire reading list we have here, uh, you'd probably be one incredibly influential person. Um, there's a video uh, by Dr. Philip Kegelmeyer uh, about the Influence Psychology Persuasion uh, book, and this link is right here. Uh, some DEF CON talks that are worth watching are uh, Social Engineering Gentleman Thief, and steal everything, kill everyone, and cause total financial ruin. Uh, the links are there. A good TV show, if you're looking for something on Netflix, is Leverage. And uh, they use social engineering uh, in, for penetration testing and engagements, basically, in every single episode. It's, uh, it's a very humanist watch, and they get a lot of things right. Um, and for a really, really deep rabbit hole adventure, you should see Yuri Bezmanov's University lectures on subversion and psychological warfare. He was a, a KGB defector back in the Cold War, and he lectures on uh, nation-state psychological warfare and group subversion. Um, and he's uh, this guy here in the absolutely subversive meme. It's a classic series of lectures. Uh, it'll probably blow your mind. For technical resources, you should see socialengineer.org. And if you're ever going to DEF CON, I highly recommend the social engineering village um, seeing the social engineering CTF is just a it's so entertaining it's so great um, the tricks they pull on people are just they're just like you can't believe they're saying and doing these things uh, it's so so great so part two physical security how attackers can gain physical access to your systems and what they can do with them this is important because people just do crazy things. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone attacking you. Uh, and this is a good story about a girl who keeps up a blog sneaking into industrial sites and taking pictures with awesome looking machinery. It's basically her hobby. But uh, this picture is of her inside a Russian missile factory. So imagine instead if this were someone from your competition or someone trying to steal secrets from you and sabotaging your facility or up to other nefarious things. So before we go any further, I want to give credits to the open organization of lockpickers, tool.us. They have fantastic diagrams and animations and they usually run a uh, village and workshop at DEF CON every year and they are a fantastic resource. So, locks. This is a picture of the lock on the right and the bolt that secures and holds a door closed. The components of a lock are the outer shell and the inner plug. Now there are pins and springs that we'll cover in a second, but if you insert a key of the proper uh, keying, the pins will be uh, left lifted to the appropriate separate separation line, and you can spin the plug freely in the keyhole in the shell. Now, for an attacker's perspective, all you will see is what you can see into the keyhole and what you can stick into it. Without a key, a lock should not turn. Instead, it will bind. And from the front perspective, that's because the top pin is keeping it, the plug, from rotating within the shell. And on the bottom left, we have an example of a almost correct key. And the bottom pin here is keeping it from turning. And on the right, the same column position on the key is uh, too deep and so the top pin is causing it to bind. So,
from an attacker's perspective, you don't know how many pins are in the lock, and all you can see in is this, if there's sufficient light. So your t job is to somehow get all of these up to the right level, and then turn the lock and open the door. So dive into more terminology. The spring is just called the spring, the top pin is called the driver, and the bottom pin is called the pin. And the cylinder, also known as the plug to some uh, people, is what uh, the key goes into and you know raises all these things up to the, the appropriate level. And so the term shear line denotes the, the separation between the shell and the plug or cylinder, which is what you, to unlock the door, unlock the lock, want to raise all of the, the drivers and pins to be level with. And so typically in standard uh, locksmithing, there are only nine levels for any individual uh, key position. And they go, actually 10, there's zero through nine. And that's important to keep in mind because there's thus a finite amount of uh, <clears throat> positions a key can be scored in. And so yeah, back to this animation, if you don't have all of the drivers, the, the pins and drivers in the right position, the plug won't turn in the shell because the pin or driver will bind it. So here's how lock picking works. You have two tools. One is a torque wrench on the bottom and the top one is a pick. It works by trying all the pins one by one iteratively while applying minor torque, minor twist to the torque wrench. And you pick the pins one by one, going back and forth, applying minor pressure until all of them have been lifted up and you can spin the lock freely. So why does this work? There are three main reasons. Manufacturing defects and imperfections, cheap materials, and people buy cheap locks. So to illustrate manufacturing defects in the plug manufacturing. You can see here that on the edges of the cylinders there's scoring marks here. There's a big score or scrape in the cylinder itself and if you look really closely and pause the video you can see that they're not all lined up evenly. Some are a little more left or right than the others and so on. To really show you, this is a plug from a somewhat, somewhat weathered lock that's been cleaned up. You'll still see dirt and stuff and the, the scrape marks, but this really illustrates that these holes are not perfectly perfect circles. Uh, this is more of an oval shaped and they also don't line up in, in a clear line. And so these imperfections are actually what allow us to pick a cylinder one by one in a lock. And what you're doing is you're pushing up the pin and driver so that the small amount of torsion you're putting on the torque wrench to twist the lock, to rotate it, is creating a shelf because of the imperfections in the interface of the shell and the plug where those two holes meet they weren't drilled at the same time and because of these imperfections they meet up imperfectly and so what you're trying to do is you're trying to by twisting the lock create a window for a shelf that you can push the cylinder up and place that driver up on the top of it and then the pin, the lower one, will fall freely. And then if you don't push too hard, you can then move on 
and do this iteratively to the next one and next one and next one. And we'll go back to that animation in a little bit. <clears throat> and so uh, this is actually the top of the shell. Um, so you can see that the holes drilled in the shell also have some imperfections. Uh, this is the top of the shell though and uh, these are also present on the bottom of it and so that when it the inside of the shell meets the plug and the cylinders are lined up there's going to be imperfections that you can exploit and there's also imperfections in the pins and the drivers they're made with really cheap materials and uh, often that allows you to uh, in some cases e pick the lock more easily so this is how it works for a one pin lock we're gonna push up with our pick and then we're gonna rotate push to one side with the torque wrench that goes in the bottom and you push up and then the shear line you'll hit and at some point you'll push the driver up and you'll be able to p turn the plug freely and so moving past one pin lock when you're looking into a, a keyhole you have no idea how many pins the lock is going to be the first thing you can do is take your pick push it all the way in lift it all the way up and then slowly pull it out and the process of doing this will send the cylinders pushing down one by one you'll hear a click or a snap and so you just then listen and you count the snaps you can often feel it uh, you will feel a little jerk a little jolt when you let go of a pen and it gets sprung down by the spring so you count how many of those occur and then you know how many pins are in the lock and so again this is the process of picking a lock the bottom tool is the torque wrench it's applying rotational force like you would after you insert the key you spin the lock to open it so you're spinning it throughout this whole process very very gently and the phenomenon that allows this is the imper imperfection here. One of these will be the leftmost, and then next leftmost, and then next leftmost, and then etc. You can almost for every lock uh, that's pickable take it apart and rank them all by what order they are and from left to right and so if you're turning it left um, it's basically going to be uh, following that order but you're guessing so you try every single one every time and let's go back to the animation to illustrate it the torque wrench is inserted little bit of torque is applied you try pins one by one lifting them up to what you guess is the shear line and you'll not necessarily hear a click when it sets but you'll definitely feel a jerk in the torque wrench because it's not binding on that pin anymore and will let you go a little bit further and so it's not going to be much it's not even going to be one millimeter but you'll feel it and so you keep doing this one pin at a time going through all of them and uh, eventually you'll get the lock open however there's some common mistakes that you need to be aware of the top two are you're putting too much tension on it if you twist this too hard the plug and the shell will pinch whatever pin or driver it's sitting on you won't be able to push anything up and this can also pinch drivers up making you think that the uh, cylinder is actually picked when it's not um, and the second most common mistake is turning the plug the wrong way 
Typically a lock is only going to unlock turn to the left or the right, typically not both. Uh, some European locks allow turning both ways. Um, now let's talk about cheating uh, in terms of what locksmiths consider cheating as opposed to traditional lock picking. And those are raking, bump keys, and snap guns. Now raking involves a different style tool that's shaped like a clothespin or a hairpin that has a wavy aperture at the front. And all you do is you put it in the keyhole and you rake back and forth. All you're doing is in and out, in and out, in and out really quick. And you're just brute forcing this. And you're trying it, manipulating the angle up and down, and you're putting torque wrench on it. And that allows you to often brute force very, very cheap locks in a matter of seconds. Now, another topic is uh, illustrated by the following graphic. This is Newton's cradle. It demonstrates conservation of momentum and energy. And when you pull back one of the balls and release it, it transfers all the energy to the last ball and leaves the, the inside balls stationary. You can pull back two and it'll make two swing out on the other side. So a bump key is designed to have really tall teeth. And what you do is you put place it in the key, you bump it really hard and twist at the same time. And this forces the drivers up, the pins stay in place mostly, and it works entirely based off this principle. Snap guns also work on the same principle. This is something you may see in video games or movies. It's just a device with the trigger that snaps this lever up and you place it in a keyhole. So there are many defenses against lock picking and the first one is buy better locks, uh, have also uh, other physical security systems like uh, cameras and uh, electronic locks and uh, but back to mechanical locks there are several lock picking mitigations that we can talk about such as security pins or security drivers that you may see on commercial products and this boils down to spool pins, mushroom pins, hybrid pins and there's also multi-dimensional plugs and cylinders that have kind of multiple key interfaces. So a spool pin or spool driver is like a spool that you wrap yarn around or string around and it's fat on the ends, thin on the inside and how this affects lock picking is when you're twisting and pushing it up you're gonna hit this edge on the plug or the shell uh, on the spool and it's gonna catch and it's going to fool the lock picker or give him a really hard time. And it's going to allow them to twist it more than uh, a normal driver would, which is going to really throw them off. And so it shows basically if you twist it all the way and then push it up, it's going to fool you. And it's going to stop you. This requires a lot of finesse to pick, and I'm not going to teach it in this lecture. But there are diagrams. This example animation literally only works for a single pin lock. So, mushroom pins are very similar. They're shaped like a mushroom, and they have a similar effect. Hybrid pins have often a security ring around them, and they have a very interesting effect, but sometimes they require uh, a specially crafted plug. You see how there's an indentation for this to sit in, and this is also an example of a mushroom pin here. Now, it's worth talking about uh, anything that has a master key. That is, it's been coded for uh, multiple different keys to work on them and this is literally how that happens. There's a encoding pin that's placed in a cylinder which may have multiple uh, scores 
in that cylinder uh, that are acceptable for opening the lock. Uh, so this is often the case in large skyscrapers and large apartment buildings where the landlord has its own set of key keys and uh, they can reprogram the locks by altering the size of these um, these encoding pins. So now to multi-dimensional plugs and cylinders. This is an example where there's two rows of teeth on the key. There's a lower and a top one. Many people have seen this. This is sometimes uh, the case for car keys. Uh, they may have it on the top and the bottom. You can look at your car keys right now and probably notice something like this. And this is what's going on. For keys that have it uh, both facing up with a lower uh, ring like this, this is effectively what's going on. There's a interface uh, that's kind of uh, extended in to the keyhole to reach the lower teeth and uh, interface with the, the shear line that affects it. And uh, they can get arbitrarily more complicated past this. But this is an example of a good lock that would take a very long time to pick. And that is the goal of locks. Wafer locks are utterly terrible. You'll often see them on security cabinets that may be guarding other keys or IDs or electronic badges that can use to access a rest of a facility. These are incredibly easy to rake. Uh, you just insert a tension wrench and the rake and you just do it real fast and often you can get in no problem. I've never found a wafer lock that I haven't been able to get into very easily. Um, and people rely on them way too much. How they work is that the plug has uh, these wafers and each wafer has a spring uh, and they're all encoded differently. Um, and they all sit in the plug like this. So they all sit in a retaining groove or a, this is another word for a shell. And it's the same principle. They basically all obstruct turning within the shell unless you raise them or set them to the proper level. Some reliable resources for lock picking. Uh, I have a friend that is very quick on getting people starter lock picking kits and the only way, literally the only way you can learn how to do this is by practicing it and doing it yourself. And uh, you can email him, gek at disillusion.us to get a cheap, uh, good quality starter pick set. And uh, to learn more, I can't recommend tool.us enough. It is a fantastic educational resource for physical security. Now, once you have physical access to a system, there are a lot of things you can do. Generally, it breaks down into you can spy on the system by placing key loggers and other uh, devices that passively or actively capture packets or information about the system. You can sabotage the system. You can destroy, damage, or degrade it. Uh, you can. It doesn't need to be sabotaged at the moment. You can set up uh, the sabotage to occur at a later date. You can steal information, exfiltrate papers, hard drives, laptops, phones, etc. And uh, there's a related talk, steal everything, kill everyone, cause total financial ruin that we talked about in the social engineering resources. It's very relevant here. Uh, his, the speaker's entire pen testing style is doing everything by physical access. It doesn't really have the greatest hacking skills or the greatest social engineering skills he just knows how to get physical, physical access and look like he fits in. So we've studied a lot about operating systems, security, exploit mitigations, and all of the software level security, but much of this security is moot if an attacker has physical access and knows what they're doing. They can do things like reset the BIOS password, they can reset operating system passwords, they can physically take your hard drives and external storage, they can install key loggers, Ethernet eavesdroppers, and other malicious hardware and chips. And uh, when you look at the hardware inside a computer, the motherboard is a bus. It is a broadcast network. If you have the ability to read or write on that network, to talk on that network, 
You can interact with other parts of the system. You can read memory from RAM. You can read sectors off the hard drive. You can influence the CPU in some cases, not all. And uh, devices that have this capability are PCI Express devices, so and other forms of peripherals, USB devices, and uh, not all can. Uh, fiber optic, uh, audio, VGA, DVI, uh, and eighth inch audio devices. I do. I think none of these can actually uh, be so uh, be used maliciously. But USBs can all day long. And so there's a whole market for custom USB devices that uh, you can program them to put up a mock uh, file system or look like a fake flash drive. But instead, it's also in the background, the firmware on the chip uh, is using the power provided by the system, but a motherboard over the USB line and it's running its own pro microprocessor and interacting with your bus in a malicious fashion. And so there's all sorts of devices nowadays. Uh, the ma most famous ones are probably the, the USB rubber ducky, the Face Dancer series, uh, the Throwing Stars, and uh, these typically range from just 30 to $100. And uh, there's, you could assemble an entire toolkit for various purposes. So now let's take a step back. We've talked about what attackers can do if they have physical access to your machines. But what about physical access to your buildings? Most people don't think about this, but there is a large attack surface for your physical building, and it starts with your power sockets. There's a few standards for having Ethernet and networking over power lines, and it's mostly amplitude modulated and frequency modulated to uh, encode the bits for transmission, but the two standards are largely X10 and BPL, which is Broadband Over Power Lines. Uh, both of these are industry standards. They're widely used by physical security systems like uh, cameras, security uh, window alarms, motion sensors, door uh, trip alarms, and anything else you can think of that would be in a physical security system. And the videos uh, that I've linked here at the top are a DEF CON 19 video by Dave Kennedy, who uh, is one of the founders of DerbyCon, and then a DerbyCon video by Rob Simmons and Josh Kelly. Both of these are very similar talks, and it's the same slide deck that's evolved. And they talk about uh, shenanigans that they do during pen tests. Um, and what they show is a number of techniques and I'll share some of them. Uh, they also focus on some of the RF side so there's Bluetooth and Z-Wave stuff for uh, hacking home automation. But uh, the point is that most people don't realize that a outside power plug, if an attacker has access to that, they can severely impact uh, some of your physical security systems. Uh, one of the first effects that they demonstrate in these videos is that if they can find a power plug, they can jam all communication that requires uh, Ethernet or broadband over power lines, which is fascinating. Um, they can spoof, intercept, and jam uh, packets on those networks. And uh, they go on to demonstrate some Z-Waves uh, effects. Uh, but another interesting effect is they... Uh, they use, in the second video, uh, BPL access points that you would just plug into your wall socket. And what that does is it offers a wireless 802.11 access point that bridges over to the Ethernet BPL uh, network. And then they just leave the building and they finish the pen test remotely. And so all they've done is they've implanted a wireless access point into your Ethernet network that's running over your power lines. And nobody does intrusion detection for that. No one. And so someone as simple as getting inside your building or coming up to the outside and 
touching one of your wall sockets can be enough to compromise or degrade some aspects of your security of your organization. So it's uh, ex I highly recommend these two talks. And uh, there's one last note I want to touch on, and that is um, for server farms. If IPMI is on and can be abused, and the data center has power over Ethernet and wake up on LAN enabled, in other words, you can ping it uh, to wake up on LAN turning on and there's power over Ethernet, uh, There are some cases in which if the server biases are not unprovisioned, if they are not locked down, attackers can leverage these techniques to use IPMI to wake up the entire farm, the entire server farm, and force it to fix pixie boot into something else the attacker has hosted, which allows for the attacker to effectively turn that entire server farm into a botnet. Um, So another aspect that's worth talking about when we're talking about hacking buildings is building automation control or networks, otherwise known as BACnet. Uh, there's a great ShmooCon 2013 talk, uh, how to own a building, uh, and they just share a BACnet attack framework, and I highly recommend it. BACnet is when you enter your grocery store or enter a large apartment building or skyscraper, and you see a control panel on one of the doors uh, on the, one of the walls by the doors and there's a lock on it and there's alarms and stuff like that. That may be your your uh, fire suppression system, but it may also be a building management system, uh, at least uh, some access point to it. And the fire suppression systems itself could be connected to the BACnet network. It touches a lot of things, including lighting, elevator controls, security access systems, fire systems, HVACs, and other, other components. It is found in almost all areas of b modern building automation, power, water, HVAC, metering, fire suppression, smart lights, smart elevators. It's also going to be found in industrial settings, so factories, plants, and uh, so on. There's a number of protocols that are used in the BACnet process, uh, including XML files, HTTP, SOAP. Um, you can have BACnet over IP. You can have BACnet over serial and you can have web HMIs that your landlord or uh, building manager can interact with. And uh, there's lots of inputs, including weather. Um, let's see what else is worth talking about. You've got uh, elevator controls, you've got HVAC controls, and et cetera. So the talk and the DEF CON video, uh, sorry, the ShmooCon video, uh, discusses general effects that you can cause at the network layer because there's no encryption in the BACnet protocol. You can spoof anything, and I believe it's stateless. And so that allows for a wide variety of denial of service techniques, as well as direct attacks to the devices and systems that are connected to by this network. Um, causing effects past that requires domain specific knowledge for the individual target and that level of discussion is outside the scope of this class but in general anyone who has access to a BACnet uh, network can at least deny the entire network uh, very easily and there's another issue that this raises is that this is an increasing problem that's facing industrial systems is that vendors often require gateways for the systems to do uh, maintenance and patching for the device either to dial back home or for the vendor to ping it in SSHN or RDPN or whatever. And uh, this is problematic. Operators are often, in the vast majority of cases, not aware of these access points that are added to their networks. And they do pose for a uh, a theoretical uh, uh, vulnerability or, you know, hole in your attack surface. Uh, so this is something that people should, in general, be aware of, uh, especially Fortune 1000 companies. So to dive down into BACnet, it's 
uh, it has minimal s session protection, minimal security. The packets are very easy to spoof. There's no encryption at all. It's very easy to intercept. And Wireshark already has BACnet dissection uh, modules that you can easily work with. Now there's more resources. Uh, Digital Bond has put out Redpoint, which is a toolkit for discovering and enumerating BACnet devices on a BACnet network. So there's just already tools good to go. And there's entire community. I highly recommend BACnet.SourceForge.net. Uh, this is a immense collection of tools and applications for doing everything from running a honeypot for BACnet systems. You can make an entire virtual honeypot building and see what people try to do to it. You, you can have a web HMI using like Mango HMI, which is actually pretty, uh, pretty friendly to set up. It's a fun little exercise. Um, and uh, they have tools for generating arbitrary packets, spinning up arbitrary services, server client, skeleton code, uh, and etc. There's much more than that. To get started with BACnet, BACnet.org has pretty good tutorials and Wireshark has some good packet captures to work through. And past that, um, depending on your organization, uh, doing penetration or the, the engagement target software defined radio is an increasingly important area for security analysis and pen tests. Uh, GNU radio is probably one of the most well known ones. Uh, Red Hawk is also a good one. Uh, SDRradio.com also has some great resources, uh, but obviously to use uh, SDR, you have to have a good antenna uh, to handle the spectrum you want to target for both uh, capturing and transmission, and you have to worry about uh, channels and etc. And uh, there's a great list of uh, reviewed uh, uh, antenna systems on this resource link. And so to wrap things up, uh, for physical access, here's a master slide of uh, resources for both videos, BACnet, uh, hardware hacking with USB and SDR stuff for your enjoyment. And that concludes today's lecture. I hope you all learned something and enjoyed this lecture. And that is it for today. Till next time.